Every year, we do something for the, uh, the Ben Ishai, we do Hilala, sometimes they're bigger, sometimes they're smaller. And um, my wife was always at the forefront organizing, etc. This year, I think everybody knows, she got diagnosed. We don't want to talk about it right now, but uh, she needs everybody's prayers, their intense prayers. And I would ask everybody to please pray for the Rabbanit, Rabbanit Ruth, Ruth Bat Ahuba. Always have her in your prayers. And um, in previous years, in previous Hilulas, I spoke about a lot of different things. It's been many years, however, since I've spoken about the life and times of Moreno Rabbeinu, Hacham Yosef Haim, Allah wa Shalom, the Ben Hai. And people come to me and say, Rabbi, we want to know about his life. I said, but I spoke many years ago. They said, but it's many years ago. We want to hear now. So this year, that's what I'm going to do. Sometimes I speak about his teaching, sometimes I speak about specific stories about him. Tonight, Be'ezad Hashem, with your permission and with God's help, I will speak about the life and times of Hacham Yosef Hayim, known as the Ben Ish Hai. He's known as the Ben Ish Hai because Ben Ish Hai is one of his works, one of his most famous works, book on Halakha, that I think everybody should have and everybody should read on a daily basis. Um, I want to say the following, that uh, his works are very numerous, and uh, even though we call him Ben Ishai after that one work, and I'll explain a little later why the work was called Ben Ishai, really one would do well to follow all of his teachings and study his teachings because they're amazing and they're followed by the Jewish world, Sephardi and Ashkenazi alike. It's amazing. I'm always amazed to see so many Ashkenazim buying his Sepharim, quoting him, um, Ashkenazim of all backgrounds, and certainly I believe it behooves us, those of us who are Sephardi, to do the same. In order to speak about his life, I would like to speak first about his grandfather. His grandfather was Hacham Moshe Hayim. He lived in the city of Baghdad. He was a fairly young rabbi, but he was very knowledgeable, very erudite, very scholarly, and also very shy. Now, sometimes when a person's shy, people just don't know what his value is. And there was an occasion where he had a disagreement with the Rosh Ab Beth Din of Baghdad. Now, Baghdad at that time, I want you to know, was a center of Torah learning. It was a place where the world over, people respected the Hachamim. Questions, she'elot, were asked to the Beit Din and the Hachamim of Baghdad from many, many parts of the world. It was a very large center of Jewish education and uh, Judaism in general. Now, Hacham Moshe Hayim, alayhi shalom, had a disagreement with the Rosh Ab Beit Din of Baghdad. So he went to the Nasi, the the president of the community, to discuss this matter with him. They did not consider his opinion at all, and he was insulted and left Baghdad and moved to Basra. Now, a few years later, a very serious question about a woman who was in Aruna. Aruna is a woman who is in limbo. She can't get divorced. She, we don't know, whether she, you know what her position is. She can't get married. And it's a very difficult situation. And a serious question about Anisha Aruna came to the Dayanim of Baghdad. He obviously heard about the whole case and he wrote a long Pesach Din, a long ruling about what should be done in this matter. And he sent it from Basra to the Rabbanim in the land of Israel. I guess he still wasn't talking too much to the, the, the Rabbanim in Baghdad. He sent it to Eretz Israel, to Israel for their opinion. The Hachmei Yerushalayim were very, very impressed with his Pesach, with his ruling, and agreed with him completely and praised him. So when the Hachamim of Baghdad became aware of this and how great he was in Torah, they brought him back. But this time they brought him back with great pomp and ceremony with a lot of honor. And he was a rabbi in Baghdad after that for approximately 50 years. 
He taught Torah, derashot, tachanot, but he was still very humble. I mean, he was loved by everybody. He was known to be firm in his opinion. He would not bend for somebody because the guy was influential or rich or something along those lines. But he did what he believed was right. He received the title of Il Hacham, which simply means the Hacham. He and his children after him were known as, meaning his sons who were the rabbis, were known as Il Hacham. Hacham Yosef Haim Alawa Shalom, the Ben Ishai, also received this title, though he would have had it of his own accord, no doubt. But nevertheless, he got it from his grandfather of Il Hacham, the Hacham. And his house, meaning his home, his wife, his family, was called, was called Beit Al Hacham, the house of the Hacham. That's it. That was simply his title. You didn't have to give any names. If you just said the Hacham, it was understood that this is who you were talking about. So it was a very, very great honor which he had received. Of all the work that he did and the, the psakdin that he gave and so on, only three of his teshuvot, only three of his responsa are printed. And they're printed by his grandson in different, uh, in different works. And I'll just give you a brief summary of what they are. The most important in my mind is that he declared every single pair of tefillin in the city of Baghdad to be pasu to be ritually unfit. And they had to redo all the tefillin for everybody. And in the meantime, the people had to continue wearing their tefillin, but without a bracha, without reciting a blessing. I'm still talking about Hacham Moshe Hayim, the, the grandfather of the Ben Ishai. He decided that it was important for the Jews to follow, and certainly the Jews of his city, to follow the opinion of Rabbeinu the Hida. Very, very important hacham, where everybody follows diligently today. And also, another work that is, uh, another ruling that is mentioned by his grandson is that he ordained that in the Amidah of Yom Kippur, we need to say it musfe and not it musaf, because there's more than one offering that is brought. Now, not long before his death, Acham Moshe Hayim Shalom was approached by a very, very important rabbi in the Ashkenazi world, Rabbi Yisrael ben Shemuel of Sokolov. He wrote a very famous work called Peat HaSholhan. And he went to Hacham Moshe Hayim Shalom for a haskama, for approbation, which he received. By the way, the uh, book was supported in... Uh, I don't know to what extent, but I know it was printed with the support of another Jewish individual in Baghdad by the name of Haskir Ruben Nashi, or Menashe if you prefer. He was my great, great, great grandfather, if I have all the greats correctly. And uh, he was also involved in, in many other activities. He, he built three synagogues in Baghdad. He was involved with uh, building uh, um, Beit Midrash, and uh, he built a synagogue in Sifat. He paid more than 50% of the cost of the Hurba in Jerusalem, near the old city that you've seen, um, and so on and so forth. In any case, a few months after this, Hacham Moshe Hayim Alawa Shalom died. Now, I'm going to come back to this later on in the lecture. I'll just put that aside for now. Among his students was a rabbi called Hacham Abdallah Somech, a very, very famous, erudite, and scholarly rabbi whose work, uh, Zibh Sedek, is a very famous one written on Yore De'a. He would eventually be the teacher of Hacham Yusuf Haim, Allah Shalom, the Ben Hai. And there were other students that he had, including Eliyahu Mani, who was a very close friend of the son of Rabbi Moshe Haim and also his grandson, the, the Benish Hai. Now, the son of Hacham Moshe Hayim, Allah Shalom, was the father of the Benish Hai, was Hacham Eliyahu Hayim. Now, he was renowned, renowned for his knowledge both in the revealed and the hidden. The, the 
simple understanding of Torah as well as the Kabbalistic aspects. And he had immensely fine midoth. He was a wonderful person, great character. Also, the family, you have to know, was wealthy. The family had money. Now, how do you blend wonderful character and having money? They entrusted him with the kupa of the kolel, all the money for the kolel, as well as for the city. Now, as you can imagine, there was often a shortfall. He would put his hand in his pocket and always make up the difference. But another story about him, Acham Eliyahu Hayim, Shalom, the father of the Ben Ishai, that I'm always touched by, is that whenever he heard that somebody was not doing well in business, went out of, his business uh, went under, people were having a hard time making ends meet, would go at night when nobody was around and leave, I just have visions of this, a sack full of money outside their front door and disappear. And nobody, nobody knew for years who was doing this. They said, of course we know who's doing this. Eliyahu and Nabi, Elijah the prophet. He told nobody. So how do we know? After he died, they found his books. And he'd written every detail, so and so, so much on such and such a day. So that was the caliber, that was the caliber of the person. I should say at this point that both of them, Hacham Moshe Hayim, was the first one who was given the privilege of being the only Hacham in the entire city of Baghdad to speak on the three special Shabbatot. His son, Hacham Eliyahu Hayim, was the same thing. He inherited that. His son, Rabbeinu Morenu, Hacham Yosef Hayim, Shalom, the Ben Ishai, was given an additional one. So for four Shabbatot in the year, the Ben Ishai was the only Hacham permitted to speak in the entire city of Baghdad, and they would all come to hear him. Acham Eliyahu Hayim, the father of the Ben Ishai, had, with his wife of course, had five boys and three girls. Of course there's the famous story of uh, the fact that they didn't have any boys for, for very many years. And his wife traveled to the Baba Sali and he wrote a note back to Hacham Eliyahu Hayim and he told him, within a year you're going to have a son. He's going to be holy from the womb. He's going to light the eyes of the Jewish people of Israel. Indeed, little Yosef, as he was called, no doubt, when he was born, showed everybody from a young age that he was very, very bright, very talented, but also extremely noble, had wonderful midot. And from a young age, he started studying in what they call the stad, the Midrash, and then he studied with his mother's uncle. There's a famous story about him that at the age of seven, he was playing with his sister in the, uh, in the basement. Now, in those days, the houses in the basements had wells. They had wells in the basement. And there is a version of the story that they had a mukway over there, but I don't think that's correct. I believe it was a well. And, um, and that's the, I think, majority opinion. And he was playing with his sister at the age of seven, and somehow she pushed him in by accident. And he started to drown, and she went running up the stairs, calling her parents that Yosef is drowning. They say, whether it's true or not, I can't verify, but they say that he made an oath as a little boy, as he was drowning, that if he would be saved, he would dedicate himself to Torah and religion. It makes no difference, because that's what he did either way. Whether he made such a nay there or not, he dedicated his entire existence to Torah and religion. Yes, they got him out, they resuscitated him, and uh, as we know, he lived. They say when he returned from the Beit Midrash, he wouldn't hang out with the family, he wouldn't sit and eat dinner together with everybody, he would go straight up to the attic. This attic became famous in his time, it was his study, it was where he spent all his hours, it was where he studied Torah. 
And even as a little boy, he would go up to the, uh, to the attic and study. At the age of 14, the age of 14, he was studying in Midrash Beit Zilcha under Hacham Abdallah Sumeich, Allah Shalom. A question came from Yerushalayim. I mentioned that questions would go to Baghdad from all over. Yes, Yerushalayim. The Dayanim, the Rabbanim in Yerushalayim would write to Baghdad to find out answers to questions they couldn't answer. A question comes to his father. It was a difficult question. His father had to research it. So his father researched it. While he was researching it, Hacham Yosef Haim, a 14-year-old boy himself, researched the question, found the answer, and wrote the answer to the Rabbanim in the land of Israel. They received the answer. They were very impressed with it. And then a little while later, they get another answer from his father. And they figured out what happened. The first one was from the son. And they wrote to the father and said, you might be surprised to learn that he gave exactly the same answer. That was a relief. Exactly the same answer. And you should be very, very proud of your dear son. <clears throat> throughout his career, of course, he responded to hundreds of people throughout the world. Throughout the world. I mentioned Israel, Greece, Izmir, here, there, everywhere. He, he uh, corresponded with uh, people in the Sephardi world, the Ashkenazi world. He corresponded with Hacham Haim Falaji, Allah wa Shalom, the Rishon Nisyon, the Dober of Vilna, and many others. At the age of 26, 26, he's a young man, his father, Il Hacham, passed away. He was a young man, the father. And uh, there were seven days of mourning. You know, it's interesting. When his father, not long before he passed away, his father was called up to the uh, Torah for Parashat Behar Sinai. And uh, the Hazan started the mashlim for him with the pasuk, Im me'at nish'ar bashanim. If there's only a little time left. He got very nervous. He says, no, 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 no. I want you to, he hinted to him to go back to the pasuk which says, Im od raboth bashanim. Where, they, where you have a lot of years left. But one way or another, he did die not long after that. And like I said, the entire city was in mourning. All the Jewish businesses closed down for the entire week. For the entire Shiva. All the businesses and stores closed down. And everyone went to the, what they call the Slav Biri, the great synagogue, to uh, hear the Hespedim. The most amazing Hesped eulogy given to Hacham Yosef, I'm sorry, to Hacham Eliyahu Hayim was by his son, Hacham Yosef Hayim, 26 year old. Everyone was stunned. When the Shiva was over, all the great and elderly Hachamim, including Hacham Abdallah Someich, his teacher at one point, came to him and said, we are appointing you the head of all the rabbis in Baghdad. I would add that Hacham Abdallah Someich, extremely great Hacham. He mentioned his work, Zib Haysedek, amazing work. But they say about him, eventually, even though he was the teacher, eventually when Hacham Yosef Hayim, the Benish Hai, would walk in to the synagogue or wherever it was, he, Hacham Abdallah, would stand for him. I would say that Hacham Yosef Hayim, we know how knowledgeable he was in all areas. That, that we know, that goes without saying. People sometimes say, but he was strict. Yeah, but he was strict in a human way. Not strict in a way, some people are strict that people just can't do what the people are asking, the Hachamim are asking of them. It wasn't like that at all. He was strict because it made sense to be strict, but it was in a human way that we could all do and we could all live our lives. He made certain changes because of the Kabbalistic aspect. You know, I'll speak to the Sephardim. As Sephardim, those of us here who are Sephardim know 
that our heritage is a blend of Peshat, the simple meaning of what the Torah tells us, and the Kabbalah, and the Sod. And he was the Hacham, and I don't think there has been anybody like him since. That's why we follow him so diligently, who was able to blend those two aspects of our religion, the, the Kabbalah and the, the simple understanding. And he blended it in a perfect way. Certain things came out of that, and we tried to follow them. He would say, for instance, you shouldn't cut your hair in the afternoon, in the evenings, or at night, because it's deen, and cutting hair is deen. But what is the great difficulty with that, if one can avoid it? He would say, we shouldn't. He had a problem with wearing black, especially on Shabbat. But even during the week, he had a problem with wearing black. Today, it's become very popular to wear black. I don't wear black. My clothes, I don't wear black. Okay? Um, it's not black. I just want you to, to check. It's a, it's, a, it's a charcoal gray, but it's not a black. Okay? Since we're being very, very uh, specific here. All right. Um, but these are, really not, these are really not major, major complications. He, as an individual, had a great love for the Jewish people. That's the point. And it comes through in his halachot, in his teachings, in his whatever he tells us we have to do, the love of the Jewish people comes out. In fact, there are times where he defends customs that people would question because he knows people do it and he wants to support the people. So what I'm saying, he was very much a people's hacham. He also had a great love for the land of Israel and especially Yerushalayim. When anyone would come to Baghdad asking for help, any messenger would come, Shruhim would come to help people in the land of Israel, he would make sure that they were helped. He himself would help them and would also try and get others to help them. He would always, as it were, be milamid zechuth. If someone would say something negative about the people in the land of Israel, he would always find a way to support them and say, really, it's not that bad. He printed most of his works and he wrote a lot of works. Unfortunately, I want you to know, many of his works have been destroyed. Um, by the Arabs, the manuscripts, and we did lose, but we, he's, he's written tons and we have very, very many of them. And he printed them all, not all, but the majority in Jerusalem. The printer in Jerusalem was a, a gentleman by the name of God Frumkin, and he said that the manuscripts would come from El Hacham, from Moreno Rabbeinu Hacham Yosef Haim Alawa Shalom, by Ottoman mail. It was the time of the Ottoman Empire, the, the, the Turks. And uh, it would take 40 days via camel to send the manuscripts. And remember, you don't have backups on, uh, on sort of devices and stuff. You, you, you're, you're entrusting your life's work on these camels for 40 days, going to Yerushalayim to get them printed there because he wanted to print them in, in Jerusalem. And only a few workers of this God Frumkin's organization were able to read it because it is written in the Sephardi script. You know, people, I don't think people even know for the most part anymore. Sephardi all wrote a specific script. And um, I think that uh, very few people do today. By the way, I do. But uh, it's, it's a form of Rashi. It's a form of Rashi. What people think is modern Israeli, that script is actually the traditional Ashkenazi, it's not modern at all, it's the traditional Ashkenazi script, which has been, as it were, inherited in the land of Israel. But Sephardim, and you look at the manuscripts of any of the Sephardi Hachamim from very many different places, and you will see that that's how they wrote. Ruben, I, you, I have to tell the story, I wasn't even thinking of it, but I see you there, I, I want you to know, Ruben Mastorov is sitting there. I remember once, many years ago, I was showing them the manuscript. I think it was the Hidayah. It wasn't even Hacham Yosef Haim. And I said, this is how Sephardim wrote. He says, no, what are you talking about? He says, we never wrote like that. And he says, we in Bukhara never wrote like that. I'm still talking about other things. His father comes and sits down next to him. He says to his father, did you ever see this handwriting? He says, sure, your grandfather used to write like that. So it was universal. Now, even Ruben agrees. At the age of 35, he went on a trip to Eretz Israel. This would have been in 5629, which corresponds to 1869. They went through the desert. 
And uh, there are a lot of dangers and difficulties in uh, going on this journey. Remember, they weren't going by plane or armored vehicle. They're going on animals and uh, carts and the like. And there were many VIPs who accompanied him, including his brother, Hachami Haskel. They were all amazed to see that on this trip, he would be studying Torah the entire day, even Baal Peh, even by heart, in his mind, what he knew. But he wouldn't let a minute go without going over his Torah studies. Even though he was riding in a wagon, he was, he was going over everything. And at midnight, he would wake up to do Tukhun Hasot and study till daylight. They went through Damascus and uh, went to Yerushalayim. On the way, there's a famous story, which um, I know I've told before, but I'll, I'll tell it again. Maybe many people have not heard it. On the way, he had explained to the Arab who was leading the, the, the group that on Shabbat they have to stop. They cannot ride on Shabbat, they have to stop. And he agreed. As Shabbat was approaching, whether he changed his mind or was just a bad area, I don't know. But as Shabbat was approaching, he said, I'm not stopping. He refused to stop. And all the travelers said, well, we're not continuing. He says, then get off and I'm not waiting for you. I'm not staying here. I'm going to keep going. So he started telling them frightening stories of bandits, robbers, and the like to scare them so that they wouldn't stop. But they said, no, they're dismounting. And they all got off their camels or whatever it was, and he went on his way. He didn't really. He went ahead, but hid. And he wanted to watch what was happening. They say on Friday night, a band of robbers came and surrounded Acham Yosef Hayim's tent. The biggest of them entered the tent, saw himself face to face with the Hacham, turned around, ran out, and everybody followed him. Now, we don't know what happened. There are two possible explanations. Some say that he saw the light shining from the Hacham's face and saw his holiness and went running out. Others say he recognized him as somebody who had helped him in a, in a court case to get with, a, with a Jew who owed him money. I don't know what the truth is. He turned around, he ran out. The camel driver seeing this came running back, went on his knees and asked for forgiveness. In any case, he got them safely to the land of Israel. There they visited the graves of all the Sadiqim. This is something major. Not like today, you get on the plane, you're in Israel, and you come back and you go again next year, or you go on, you know, in six months or in three years, whatever. No, no, this is something major. It was the only time he traveled to the land of Israel. And they went to all the graves of all the Sadiqim, of all the, the righteous Hachamim who were, who were buried there. Something very interesting happened to him when he was standing at the grave of Benayahu ben Yehoyada. All of a sudden, all these incredible secrets came to him. Just by virtue of the fact he was standing next to the grave of Ben Ayahu Ben Yehoyada. And he realized that he was a Nisus, a spark of the soul of Ben Ayahu Ben Yehoyada. There is a Pasuk in Shemuel Be, in the Nabi, which reads, Ubnayahu ben Yehoyada. Benayahu is the name of one of Hacham Yosef Hayim's works. Ben Yehoyada is another one of his works. It continues. Ben Ishai, the son of a living man. That's another one of his works. It's pronounced Ben Ishail. That's another one of his works. Rab Pe'alim, that's another one of his major works, responsa in four volumes. Mechapsiel, that's another one of his works. I want to talk to you for a second about Mechapsiel. When I was quite young, my father, Allah wa Shalom, told me, he says, Sefer Mechapsiel, this book Mechapsiel exists because Hacham Yosef Haim quotes it all the time, but we don't have it. He said it exists, but different people have parts of it and nobody's willing to give it up. I said, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. How can that be? He says, that's the story. That, that's how it is. My father told me. Now my father tells me. My father's not going to tell me something he's not sure about. And he was definite. 
I repeated this over the years. Everyone tells me you're nuts. I said, why am I nuts? He said, yeah, it was destroyed with all his other books. Why would somebody sit on it? Good question. A few months ago, I get an email. Somebody has part of it. He wants a lot of money for it. And now somebody tells me about two weeks ago, you know I heard something. Different people have parts of it. I said, really? My father told me this many, many years ago. So we're waiting. There's no doubt sooner or later this book, Mechab Siyed, is going to come out. It has to come out. Works of Hacham Yosef Haim, we need them, and they have to come out. While he was in Israel, he got several letters from somebody by the name of Sir Albert Sassoon. For those of you who are not familiar, I will tell you that the Sassoon dynasty was a very major dynasty and they were now based in Bombay. The story is basically like this. There was Sheikh Sasson, who was the prince, the Nasi of the Jewish community. He had a son, Dawid, David. There was a, a wicked Pasha who was ruling Baghdad and he saw the opportunity to take this very wealthy family and took the boy David who was 17 and threw him in jail. He tells the father, you want to see him again alive? You give me a big ransom. The father pays a big ransom. This guy was nasty, 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 nasty. He, he got a couple of Jewish brothers to help him get elected and then he killed them and so on and so forth. So Sheikh Sasson didn't fight with him. He paid the money. As soon as his son came out, he says, I don't trust this guy. You're taking the next boat to Basra. No, check that. You're not taking the next boat to Basra. We're renting a boat. And you're going to go right away because I don't trust the Pasha. So immediately they go down to the river. They get a boat. And he goes to Basra. They say that he was there that evening, prayed with them, whatever it is. Next morning he took a, a boat to Bushir in, in Persia. The very next sailing, official sailing, brought the henchmen of the Pasha to take him back to Baghdad, but he was gone. When he was in, when he was in uh, Bushir, it was okay. He said, but I got to expand my horizons. He went to India. He went to Bombay, looked around. He says, yes, I think I can do something here. He went back, brought his whole family, including his elderly father, if I'm not mistaken. He certainly brought him to, to Iran. I'm not sure whether he made it to, to Bombay, but certainly he brought the rest of his family. The rest is history. They built Bombay. What do I mean by that? They built mills. They employed thousands of people. They brought people from Baghdad and they had locals. They built docks, schools, universities, you name it. It was unbelievable what they did. They were trading all around the world. They say, at that time, nothing traveled by land or sea that didn't carry the stamp of the Sassoon dynasty. Eventually, some remained in Bombay, some moved to other places. Sir Albert Sassoon, who I just mentioned, moved to England. He was knighted by Queen Victoria. In fact, the British even went to war to protect their interests at one point. That's how significant they were. So this Sir Albert Sassoon, who is still in Bombay at this point, before he moved to England. By the way, I have to throw in, he's my great-great-grandfather. I, I just wonder why he didn't leave me some of that uh, wealth. I guess he didn't know I was going to be around. Or maybe he did, that's why he didn't leave me. I don't know, whatever it is. He didn't, he didn't leave a, a check or a bank account for me. But whatever it is, Sir Albert Sassoon writes several letters the Chacham Yosef Haim was now in Israel says, I'm paying for everything. Come to Bombay. Now Bombay, I want you to know, was a major, because of the Sassoons, a major settlement, if you like, for Jews from Baghdad. Major. Now I grew up in that community. My father was the head of that community. He was the, he was the Chacham and, the, and, the, and the, the president and everything for that community. And Everything for Baghdad was us, was, was, was with us. Meaning that whatever they said, we did. We certainly followed Hacham Yosef Haim, the Benish Hai and everything.
What is the significance of this book that my mother wrote, Baghdadian Jews of Bombay? It's everything, it's everything that we went through, and this is an amazing work. And he's, he's, this picture right here, by the way, this is David Sassoon, if anyone can see it. Anyone can see it? This is David Sassoon, my great, great, great grandfather, okay? From my father's mother's side. All right. There's a chapter on Midrash Ben Ishai there too. It's worth getting just for that. So he writes to him and says, we're paying for everything. Please come to Bombay. Now this is something very major for him to go to Bombay where everybody is waiting to see him. Everything paid. And it's Sir Albert Sassoon of all people who's telling him, I want you to come. And what does Hacham Yusuf Hayim Alawa Shalom say? No. Why? I tell you why. Because this, as they call him, Arimi Babel, this, this lion from Babylon, the greatest hacham of his time, who everybody respected, promised his mother before he went to Eris Israel that right after that he would return to Baghdad. Kibud Im, he turned down what nobody could imagine that he would turn down because he was a hacham to the core. His mother said, I want you to come back. And he said, Marat me or whatever he called her, I will come back right away. That was it. Most people would find excuses to change. Hey, this is a great opportunity. He didn't do that. I think I threw that in just for us to understand that he was a real person. He was a real person. He wasn't just a, a, a king sitting on a throne. Like, you could forgive him if he had become that. He didn't. He was a real person. Bef before he died, I'm kind of jumping, I'll come back. But I just want to throw this in because it's connected with Eris. Before he died, he got a letter from the Rabbanim in the land of Israel asking him to please come to Israel and become the Rishon Lishon, to become the head over there. And uh, he declined. He never took public position. Not in Baghdad or anywhere else. But that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean anything. They didn't do anything without consulting with him and without his say-so. But he was not officially anything, even though in fact he was everything. So he said that he wouldn't do it. Now he asked his Talmud who had moved to the land of Israel, Haham ben Sion Hazan. He asked him to give a reply to one of the Rabbanim who had asked him to move to Eretz Israel and told him, could be when you go to him, you'll find he's not there. In which case, do such and such. So he went to him and he was told that the rabbi had to leave in a rush for another, another place altogether. And he asked the man's son, did you know that uh, this was the case? And had your father written to Acham Yisuf Haim saying that he wouldn't be here? He said, no, he did not. So Acham ben Sion Hazan wrote to Acham Yisuf Haim and said, this rabbi left in a rush. Nobody was expecting it, yet you knew that this was quite likely to happen. The rabbis here are amazed and say that you have Ruach HaKodesh divine inspiration. It is a lower level, it's not prophecy per se, it is a lower level divine inspiration. What did Hacham Yisuf Haim have to say about this comment, that you have divine inspiration? He said the following. He wrote to the yeshiva and he said, I saw in one of your letters that I have Ruach HaKodesh. He says, that's as far from the truth as can be. Because Hazal tell us, since the destruction of the Beit HaMagdash, since the destruction of the temple, only little babies have it. However, there are different stories that seem to indicate that he did. In Ben Yehoyada, one of his works, as I mentioned, he speaks about a very big rabbi in Baghdad who dreamt about another big rabbi in Baghdad that he was the Gilgul of Ahaz Melech Yehuda, the, the king of Judah, who needed to make a lot of tikkunim for all the things that he had done. Hacham ben Sion, his disciple who moved to Israel, said, I'm going to give the secret. 
that this was Hacham Yosef Haim about Hacham Abdallah Sumech. How did he know? He says, how could he have known if it weren't for what we're talking about? And Hacham Yosef Haim used to send Hacham Abdallah, his former teacher, information of what he should do, tikkunim for his soul, reparation for his soul, because he was a Gilgul. And Hacham ben Sion Hazan says, I really didn't know whether I should say this or not, because since Moreno Rabbeinu Hacham Yosef Haim Alawa Shalom did not want to make it known that he had Ruach HaKodesh, I didn't know whether it was okay for me to say it or not. I want to give you another little story about this. When Hacham Abdallah Sumeh Alawa Shalom died, there was a whole, a whole hullabaloo going on in Baghdad at the moment. There was cholera, there was a cholera outbreak. They, they, they buried him somewhere. Whatever it is, the government got involved. They made everything difficult. Doesn't matter. Hacham Yosef Haim Alawa Shalom is giving a, a hespeh. The Ben Ishai is giving a eulogy for his former teacher, Hacham Abdallah Sumeh. He quotes the Pasuk, Ya Ezu Hasidim Bechabod Yerannenu Al Mishkebotham. He says, This is very odd. What's odd? He says, Look at it. You have the word Kabod, which is in the singular, honor, and you have Mishkebotham, their resting places, in the plural. That doesn't make sense. Either both should be in the singular, or both should be in the plural. And he said, that a Sadiq, the righteous individual, has two kibodim, two honors, and two mishkavot, two resting places. Now, Hacham Yosef Haim was renowned for his skills in speaking and keeping people attentive for three, four hours at a time. I mentioned that four. Shabbatoth in the year, he would be the only hacham to speak in the, the entire city of Baghdad to, we're told, as many as 10,000 people. People would be hanging uh, on the walls, on the ceiling, and near the windows, on the roof to hear him, outside. And they say everyone could hear him, by the way. They said that the, his son later on tried to speak and nobody could hear him, or very few people could hear him. He says, I'm, I'm speaking as loudly as I can, but this is proof that, that it's the... Um, the Shekhinah that's speaking from my father's throat. The fact that so many people were able to hear him. But he was known to sit there, stand there for hours and have people enthralled. Now he's giving a drasha, he's giving a hesped about Hacham Abdallah Sumeich. He starts talking about the fact that this is kabod in the singular Mishkebotham in the plural and then starts talking about something else. This doesn't make sense. This is not Hacham Yosef Haim. He sees a thing through. He didn't finish his point. And he starts talking about other things. Everyone's confused. They've heard him speak many times, but this is the first time such a thing has happened. Later on, Hacham Abdallah Sumeich had to be removed from that cemetery. I told you there was a lot of complication. And then buried again in the main cemetery. Again, Hacham Yosef Hayim Alawa Shalom gave a hespade. He says, remember what I was saying about two honors and two resting places? This is what I was talking about. So, certainly people felt that he did indeed have Ruach HaKodesh. Whatever he said was accepted by everybody. All the Hachamim accepted. Hacham Abdallah Sumeich for his work, Zib Hesede, actually sent sent the manuscript to Hacham Yosef Haim Alaw Shalom. And he made all kinds of comments, but Hacham Abdallah got sick and he didn't see him for a while, so he lost some of them. But what he remembered, he told Hacham Abdallah, and immediately Hacham Abdallah went and made the changes. Didn't question anything, went and made the changes. The Rosh Abed Din in Baghdad was somebody by the name of Hacham Yaschil Halewi. He was known to be very tough, very tough. Nobody could sway him this way or the other. What he wanted to do, he did. Nobody could convince him differently. But he said about Hacham Yosef Haim, I will never question him. If he says right is left or the opposite, I will do what he says. Because his words, Ahalacha le Moshe Misinai, they're from Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu at Har Sinai. And his words, these are what he said, are Miruah HaKodesh. His words 
are from divine inspiration. The people also were very, very affected by him. They, they, Parashat Noah, once he spoke about how, the, how the, uh, it was best to use for the sasith, the wool of sheep, and the smart businessmen went out and bought as much stock as they could, and in no time they were sold out. The same thing happened when he praised the Siddur of the Ariza. They bought as many as they could, and in a few days they were sold out, because everybody loved everything about him. There's a story about him that I've mentioned in the past, but it's one of my absolute favorite stories. And uh, those of you who have not heard me speak about him in the past will not have heard the story possibly, but I would like to mention it today. They say that every Moshe Shabbat, every Saturday night, he would study in his famous attic, his famous study. And the rumor was that Eliyahu Nabi, Zechul Elijah the prophet, used to come and visit him for about an hour every Moshe Shabbat in his attic. He would ask his servant to bring two glasses of wine. And afterwards he would come and take two empty glasses out. The Talmidim of Midrash Beit Zilcha, the yeshiva, said, you know, we got to get to the bottom of this. We've got to find out if Hacham Yosef Haim is really studying with Eliyahu Nabi, Zechul Latob, in his attic on Mosi Shabbat. So they cooked up a whole, you know, kids in yeshiva can be, uh, can be quite smart. They said, they took one of the young hachamim, the hacham Yoshua Sarboni, one of the favorites of the Ben Ishai, they said, this is what you're gonna do. You're gonna go up his stairs, up his stairs as fast as you can, and just barge in into the room. The hacham, I have a big question to ask you. <gasps> under the pretext that you have this terribly important matter to ask, and then you're gonna see whether it's true or not. And that's what they decided they're gonna do. Moshe Shabbat comes, Hacham Yoshua Sarboni goes to El Hacham's house. He's halfway up the stairs to the attic, the door opens, Hacham Yosef Haim comes out and he says, my dear Yoshua, do you boys in the yeshiva have nothing better to discuss? I'm willing to bet nobody called him on his cell phone to tell him that was happening. He says, go back and tell them the following. I don't think anyone knows what he told him to tell them because I doubt he told them. I'm sure he went back and said, guys, I'm not doing this again. You're not going to believe what happened to me. And the whole story came out. Question is, his soul was obviously at an enormously high level, enormously high level. How come he came in that generation? This is almost our generation. It's our time. He passed away in 1909. It's sort of our time still. It's not like this was for generations, many generations earlier. How come somebody at this level, we don't hear about people like this. How come someone at this level came in effectively our time? They say the very great sage, Hacham Yehud Aftaya told one of his disciples. Hacham Yehud Aftaya said the following. He said that the reason was that really he was a Tanna. He was supposed to have been at the time of the Mishnah. His soul was the soul of a Tanna. That HaKadosh Baruch Hu said that the world would need him in the generation when he came and we would need him in our generation subsequently with his teachings and God held him back and brought him at that time to have influence on coming generations. It's not the only time that has happened. So that is the explanation of how, how it is that somebody so great came at such a time. Did the whole world love him? I'm kind of indicating the whole world loved him. Pretty much the whole world loved him. However, anyone who was against religion, anyone who did not want to see Torah true ways flourish, would not have been his greatest fan. I want to tell you a story of one Jacob Obermeyer from Steinhardt, Germany. 
He was very much part of the Haskalah, which became the reform movement. In 1876, he went to Baghdad for a couple of reasons. One was to teach French at the Persian prince in exile there, someone by the name of Abbas Mirza, and also to teach French at the Alliance Israelite Universelle, the Alliance School in Baghdad. Now, I want to give you a little bit of background here. The Alliance School was, many people speak of it in glowing terms, but it did terrible, terrible destruction in many places. We have to understand what it was. It was a school that was founded by a French Jew who married a non-Jew and who brought his children up as Catholics. His purpose was to spread French culture, not Jewish culture, throughout the Edot HaMizrach, the Sephardi world. And his aim was to promulgate enlightened Judaism, which effectively means reform Judaism, in the Eastern communities. As long as Hacham Yosef Hayim was alive, he could not succeed because he stood up as a pillar against it. Once he went, they did terrible devastation. In any case, this person hated Hacham Yosef Hayim, Obermeyer for obvious reasons. And what did he hate about him? Well, a lot of things. He had a vendetta against him. One of the things that he hated is that Hacham uh, Haim knew and was steeped in Kabbalah. This didn't, this didn't jive with his enlightened, quote unquote, concept of Judaism, where anything goes, the reform Judaism. Kabbalah was too far removed for this, so he's very upset with that. He uh, didn't like the fact that he was in an area with Eastern culture, Sephardic culture. He didn't like it. Maybe he enjoyed the salary he was getting, but he didn't like being among the people. He didn't like the fact that Hacham Yosef Haim was from a wealthy family. He didn't like something else too. Hacham Yosef Haim would never give haskama, never give approbation to anyone's work. If you would write a work, who greater than Hacham Yosef Hayim to say, I approve of this work. And he wouldn't do it. And he never asked for approbation. Open any of his works. Open Ben Ishai, open any of his works. You will see there is no Haskama in the beginning. Why? Was he arrogant? Too arrogant to ask for Haskama? Was he too arrogant to give it to somebody else? Not at all. Do you remember what I asked you to remember earlier in the lecture? His grandfather, Hacham Moshe Hayim, gave Haskamah to Peat HaSholhan, and a few months later, he died. For that reason, Hacham Yosef Hayim Shalom would never ask for or give Haskamah for any Sefer. Perhaps Obermeyer didn't know that, but perhaps he didn't want to know that. He wrote the most despicable articles in a Jewish publication called Hamagid in Lick in Germany with libelous attacks against the character of this great hacham, this great sage. The truth is his rantings and ravings also give us some background of what was going on there historically because he, he says there were 15 synagogues that were operating regularly. Three, he said, very ancient. Three built more recently by one of my forefathers to by somebody else, and so on and so forth. The point is this. The editor of Hamagid had no idea who this was about and had published the articles. Now, he was safe. This was written in a German publication. He was in Baghdad. Nobody in Baghdad would know about it, right? Wrong. There was one person in particular in Baghdad who loved the Jewish people all over the world, whatever their origins, and he wanted to know everything about them. And he used to read Hamagid. Of course, I'm talking about the Ben Ishai. So the rabbis, of course, all found out about it. The despicable letters that were being written, they were incensed. And Obermeyer was excommunicated. There, the ban was printed in all the synagogues, pasted on all the streets. 
they wrote to the Rishon Nesion in, in Israel, and the rabbis of Jerusalem wrote a similar letter to HaLebanon, which was a similar magazine that was printed, a publication in Yerushalayim. Obamaya had criticized the changes that Acham Yosef Haim made. But the rabbis wrote, we support every single one of them. They're all correct. The results of the ban on Obermeyer were astounding. At this precise moment when this was going on, he received a telegram. Anybody here remembers what a telegram is? Okay. He received a telegram. I'll try and get one from a museum next time and I'll show it to you. He received a telegram advising him of his mother's death. Many people saw a connection here. Be that as it may. What's much more significant is that from the entire population, Jewish population of Baghdad, which was a thriving, flourishing Jewish community, not one solitary Jew crossed the threshold of his home to go to the Shiva during the week of mourning. Not one. He was forced to publicly apologize to Acham Yosef Hayim and left Baghdad in disgrace. We've mentioned his erudition in the Kabbalah. I'd just like to touch briefly on this. I've spoken in the past about it. People ask, what should we follow? My simple answer to people is you should follow the ways of your forefathers. In the Ashkenazi world, there were some who followed the Pshat, others who followed Pshat and Sod, some followed Sod. The Sephardi world generally followed a combination of Pshat and Sod. There has been nobody in our recent past, in my humble opinion, the likes of Hacham Yosef Hayim, Alawa Shalom, who was able to blend the two together, the way we always did it. The feeling of the pshat and the feeling of the sod, the two together, the way they come together, in accordance with our holy traditions, the way our forefathers did it. People today, those who follow him, are going in his footsteps. But nobody seems to be able to come out with it the way he did. The beauty of how he did everything. And it seems to me that if we're keen on keeping the authentic ways of our forefathers, after all, that's who we are, then Hacham Yosef Hayim is the one who probably has summed up our minhagim and our customs the most accurately. We started late because of all the complications. So I don't want to keep you all very late, but there are a few more things that I would like to, to mention to you. I'll mention them a little bit in short. There was a time when there was a shortage of commodities in Baghdad. And Acham Yosef Haim Alawa Shalom was giving drashot that people should not hoard. His brothers, who were running the business, which was actually in his name, were accused of hoarding. It was not true, but the government got involved. The government took all five brothers, remember he had four brothers, so all five brothers includes him, through the, through the streets, arrested them and took them to jail. Ahamis of Haim was released immediately, but it was a humiliation. The brothers were kept in jail for a year. And then it was found out that it was all lies. And they were released. But his mother couldn't take it. She was a noble woman. The humiliation to her family, she died. Most people, most people would say it was the fault of this person, that person, the other person. Do you know what Hakam Yusuf Haim Alawa Shalom said? something wrong with me. I have to look into my deeds. For seven years, he did not leave his home. 
He put himself in virtual house arrest. He did not go to the synagogue. He didn't go anywhere. But before you think, wow, that sounds like fun, let me tell you what he did. He fasted every single day that he was permitted to fast, obviously not Shabbat and holidays, for seven years. In the month of Elul, we're supposed to do Pishpush Amasi more than other times. We're supposed to look closely at our deeds. Before we go to bed, we have to see what we did during the day. What did we do wrong? Nobody wants to do that. Even in the month of Elul, we don't want to do that. He did it for seven years. We have to understand this shows the greatness of a person. It's so much easier to blame everybody else. But for seven years, he did these inuim to himself. In 5,669 in the Jewish calendar, which uh, corresponds to 1909, a few days before he passed away, he visited the grave of Yehazkel HaNabi, the uh, prophet Ezekiel. He rested in a village called Chifil. I believe he had a family home there. He got sick, and a few days later, on the 13th of Elul, 1909, he passed away. His body was immediately brought back to Baghdad, but it was a two-day journey. And it arrived on the 15th of Elul at night, and they took him to the graveyard. They say that thousands upon thousands of people came. Jews, Christians, Arabs, all came. There is an opinion that there were 150,000 people at his funeral. 150,000 is huge anywhere, but for the city of Baghdad it was unheard of. They say even babies came. I imagine they were brought by their mothers. Again, all the shops and businesses closed. Everyone went to hear, to hear the Hespedim. The fact that he died not in his home didn't seem to make sense. Why did this happen? He was 17 hour, two day journey away. Why did that happen? Hacham Shimon Arasi Allah wa Shalom, who took over many of his positions afterwards, a big Mekubal, said he was forced to relate something that he really felt that he maybe shouldn't. But because of this, he was forced to relate it, that Hacham Yosef Hayim was actually the Shoresh, the root of the soul of Yosef HaSadiq, Joseph. And that is why, like Yosef, he had to be born in one place and die in the other. People ask me repeatedly, where is Hacham Yosef Hayim Alawa Shalom buried? Well, let me tell you this story. They say on the night of the 13th of Elul, he died on the 13th of Elul, Hacham Abraham Adas in Yerushalayim had a dream. It was after midnight. And he dreamt that Hacham Abraham Lanyado Allah wa shalom was wearing white and walking. And he said to him, where are you going? He says, Hacham Yosef Hayim has passed away in Babel, in Babylon. And I'm going to bring him to Jerusalem. He awoke and fell asleep again and dreamt again. And he dreamt that the mitah, they didn't use coffins. In America we have to use coffins, but Israel, other places we don't use coffins that his body and whatever it was on, he dreamt, came to Yerushalayim. And that all the hachamim in Yerushalayim were giving hespedim, big hespedim, eulogizing hacham Yosef Hayim. He awoke and in the morning went to the hachmei babel, the, the, the hachamim who had originated from Baghdad, who were in Jerusalem. And they asked him, he asked them, what about hacham Yosef Hayim? Do you hear anything? They said, oh, we don't know, we didn't hear anything. A few hours later, a telegram came. I really should have brought one with me. A telegram came, and it said, indeed, sad news. Hacham Yosef Hayim Allah wa Shalom passed away. And Hacham Adas told them the dream. There is a belief that his bones appeared in Yerushalayim. Indeed, there is a big maseba in Yerushalayim that they say is Hacham Yosef Hayim. I asked Hacham
Thank you. One of my father's closest friends and uh, Acham that I always looked up to and used to write to with Sheilot and, and the likes. Acham Sasan Hugi, Allah wa Shalom, the son of uh, Acham Hugi Abudi, who was the uh, Salman Hugi Abudi, was the uh, eventually the Abbe Din in Yerushalayim. And I remember asking him about this. I said, where is Hacham Yusuf Haim, Allah wa Shalom, buried? He said, yes, there is this story. But Hacham Yusuf Haim is buried in his grave in Baghdad. And in fact, there are many stories that corroborate this. They say that uh, there's a famous story that went around among the Jewish people of a young boy who got sick and could no longer speak. They went to the grave of Hacham Yosef Hayim Alawa Shalom and they cried and prayed and didn't leave the place till he was healed and able to speak. There are other stories. There's a story of a, an Arab who was trying to do something despicable to the grave of Hacham Yosef Hayim and he was paralyzed. And then when he kind of regretted fully what he had done, he became okay again. Obviously, these things probably wouldn't take place if he wasn't buried there. So it does indeed appear that Hacham Yosef Haim, Alawa Shalom, even though some people in Yerushalayim might disagree, is indeed still buried in Baghdad. In fact, during the, uh, the Gulf War, they said that they, they found his grave. All right, El Hacham is gone. Moren Rabbeinu, Hacham Yosef Haim, Alawa Shalom, the Ben Ishai, is not physically with us, but he has left us a very precious legacy. He has left us teachings, books, works, very many. And it is an inheritance that one has to treasure more than if he had left us gold and jewels. He felt very strongly that one had to hold on to his tradition. He dressed himself like the old Rabbanim because he believed one should not change one's customs. What should we do? He was like a father to us. We're like his children. Like a father who leaves his son a legacy, we must continue his legacy. We must continue to learn from him. What we must do is continue to learn the works of Hacham Yosef Hayim, Allah wa Shalom, the Ben Ishai, following his footsteps. The Sefer Ben Ishai is one book. Learn it every day. But he's written a numerous amount of works. Go to Shurim. If you can learn them yourself, do. Go to Shurim where they're taught. As I say, Jews of all backgrounds study his works. This is the legacy that he has left us. He is an amazing person who was held back from the time that he was supposed to have been brought to the time of the Mishnah till effectively our time so that we would have the benefit of him at a time that we need him. It is my prayer that we will be able to uh, continue in his footsteps, continue his legacy, and hopefully do what is right, do what is right in the eyes of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and for his zechut, may we all witness the coming of Mashiach Sidkeinu, may it come b'mera b'yameinu, v'echen yirasom v'nomar amen.